Hello and welcome to the final part of this lecture series on massive asymptotically Euclidean manifolds. <clears throat> I'd like to describe some uh, more recent work here, uh, and this will include some joint work with uh, Hugh Bray, Sven Hirsch, Marcus Curie, Yu Zhang, and also uh, Daniel Stern, who also gave a very nice uh, series of lectures uh, in the first uh, Geometric Analysis Festival. OK, so let us uh, begin. So as usual, we'll be looking at an asymptotically flat three-dimensional initial data set, MGK of order tau greater than or equal to 2. OK, I'd like to introduce uh, the notion of this space-time harmonic equation. Uh, OK, so first let's uh, fix a, a function on our initial data set, u. I now consider the following symmetric two tensor. You know, this is a section of uh, t star m, symmetric product t star m. I call it Hessian bar. Um, nabla bar squared of u uh, equal to the usual nabla squared u, the, the usual uh, Hessian of mg. Uh, nabla there is the connection with respect to g. Uh, and then plus the norm of the gradient of u times uh, the second fundamental form k. All right, this is a symmetric two tensor given by a function. Uh, it has the following interpretation. Um, notice I call this a, a null space-time Hessian of this function. Uh, it has the following interpretation. OK, think of m sitting inside of uh, our four-dimensional space-time. Uh, this is m, larger space is n. Uh, and you have some uh, time-like uh, normal vector e0. Then uh, you can describe the Hessian in the following way, the space-time Hessian in the following way. You take u, it's differential, that's a one form on m, uh, and then you turn that into a one form on uh, some section of uh, the cotangent bundle of the larger manifold n by uh, adding a normal part to it in such a way um, so that the resulting one form is null. Notice this has length uh, zero because we've scaled the normal component so that it is exactly the same uh, length but negative uh, as the part tangential to m. OK, and then we take a, uh, apply the, the connection coming from n that it's a connection of n uh, to this one form, and this defines a symmetric uh, two tensor on the larger manifold n, and we take its tangential part. So it's tangential part of this business. Uh, that is uh, another formula for this space-time Hessian. OK. <clears throat> uh, we take a trace of this uh, to find an elliptic equation that we can we can solve. You know, the space-time Hessian can't can't solve that equal to zero or anything like that. So very overdetermined. Um, but we take the trace of the space-time Hessian, uh, find this operator, which we're calling the uh, space-time harmonic equation. Uh, notice if k is zero, if k vanishes, or if merely trace k vanishes, then uh, this reduces to just the harmonic equation. Laplace equation. OK, uh, it's a nonlinear equation due to the presence of the norm of uh, the gradient of u, but only mildly so. Um, and in fact, one can show you can, you can solve this equation uh, on, on your initial data set uh, asymptotic to some given linear function at infinity. The model for this is the following. You consider Minkowski space. R31, uh, consider some initial, uh, you know, some Ramanian slice here. 
uh, m sitting inside of R31. Uh, and what we're doing is uh, we're considering the restriction of, say, uh, x, y, or z uh, plus t, you know, restricted on to m. This is the sort of function that uh, we're considering. Um, notice that, say, x plus t, uh, the differential of it, and you're computing the length using Minkowski metric, uh, it's null, you know, null one form. Uh, OK, so the level sets of such functions are planes, you know, uh, three dimensional planes uh, in uh, Minkowski space, and they intersect our uh, Ramanian hypersurface M uh, in some, some interesting way given these squiggly lines, uh, these green squiggly lines. And uh, these are the level sets of the space-time harmonic function. This is, this is the model uh, that we're trying to replicate on a general initial data set. You can consider these uh, certain types of uh, uh, coordinate functions uh, on the initial data set. OK. Notice that not only are uh, x plus t uh, you know, they're, they're the model, uh, the model solutions, uh, because if you consider x plus t restricted to uh, this uh, hypersurface M, uh, compute uh, its spacetime Hessian, uh, this will, in fact, vanish, because they're in the kernel of um, the uh, Hessian for Minkowski space. They are. The differentials are parallel with respect to the connection on Minkowski space. OK, so here is the setup. Uh, the claim is that this is a very good function to, uh, uh, yeah, these are very good functions to study if you want to relate uh, mass to the dominant energy condition. Uh, in fact, we have the following theorem uh, from 2020 to the Sven Hirsch, myself, and Marcus Curie. So given initial data set as above, uh, and some given linear function at infinity uh, in the asymptotic coordinates, uh, there is a space-time harmonic function, a solution to this equation, which is asymptotic to uh, the given coordinate at infinity. OK, that's the first statement. There is a solution to this equation with these asymptotics. Uh, and second, you have the following statement. Uh, the energy of the initial data set plus the portion of uh, <clears throat> the linear momentum, the total linear momentum pointing in the direction of A, or A are just the coefficients that determine the, the linear function, um, is bounded below by the following quantity. 1 over 16 pi um, times the integral over some portion of the initial data set. So this here, this generalized exterior region uh, on which the uh, function u is defined, it's uh, not uh, m itself, but uh, some initial data set that you get from m, which has um, an end isometric to the end of m that we are considering. That's a technicality. We'll worry about that later. Uh, but there is. <clears throat> some auxiliary space generalized exterior region uh, on which uh, u is defined and the mass of the end of m that we are talking about, uh, or at least uh, this combination of e and the linear momentum is bounded below by the space-time Hessian squared over the length of the gradient uh, plus two times mu minus norm j the quantity appearing in the dominant energy condition, uh, time weighted by the by the gradient of u. Okay, so an explicit lower bound for this combination of e and p. Uh, so in particular, uh, if uh, you take l to be, well, I guess the way I've described things here, uh, take uh, a i to be minus pi, uh, 
and apply the theorem to the corresponding space-time harmonic function, uh, then you get a lower bound for E minus, uh, uh, I guess this should be over the norm of P uh, minus norm of P greater than or equal to uh, this right-hand side. This is if the total momentum is not already vanishing. Okay, so uh, in particular, you get a, a non, if you have the dominant energy condition being satisfied, then uh, you get the uh, non-negativity of this, uh, of the total mass of this end of your initial data set. So you get the positive mass theorem, the positivity of it as a, as a corollary. Um, also, if uh, the mass happens to vanish, then you get some, uh, you can get the rigidity result as well. Um, namely that you lie inside of, uh, you know, if the, if the mass of your uh, end of your initial data set vanishes, then your initial data set should arise from uh, uh, Romanian hypersurface of Minkowski space. Uh, this is a, you can see this is a little bit of a, um, qualification of the, or, you know, refinement of the positive mass theorem, uh, you can tell if the, if the left-hand side is very small uh, and the dominant energy condition is uh, satisfied, then you can kind of ignore that and imagine this is small. Uh, then this says that you have these functions, um, U, which satisfies some kind of, um, that are close to being parallel with respect to some connection. So it gives you a, a feeling, a, a sense in which uh, you, you are close to uh, being flat in some sense. Uh, maybe in the Ramanian setting, uh, things will be a little bit more uh, concrete or explicit. Uh, let's describe how this works, uh, how we arrive at this, uh, at this theorem <clears throat> in the Ramanian setting. So here, uh, let's think, Uh, uh, K identically vanishes. So let's work in the Ramanian setting. Let me explain the idea uh, and look at the result again. And uh, maybe th this will this will help uh, elucidate. Okay, so the main idea uh, comes from Daniel Stern. Uh, a couple of years ago in an interesting uh, paper, 2019, uh, he studied the scalar curvature of Ramanian particular closed three manifolds uh, and their relation to harmonic maps to S1. A very remarkable paper, definitely worth, worth reading. <clears throat> so here is the idea. Um, so you have an M3, uh, and then you have a map to S1, or say, for us, let's just consider a map to R. We're considering functions, solutions to elliptic equation. Uh, U, and uh, the idea is to consider, you know, what does U, and in particular its gradient, know about the curvature of M? Uh, well, the Bachner formula gives an answer to that. In particular, the Laplacian, I guess one half the Laplacian of the norm squared of U squared uh, is given by the Hessian of u squared for, you know, for, for harmonic function u. Uh, you compute this, uh, and you see the Ricci curvature of the gradient of u in the direction of the gradient of u uh, appears. This is the Bachner formula. Very very important fundamental uh, piece of geometric analysis, foundation to geometric analysis. Um, okay, so the, you know, a one form or a vector field given by the differential or the, the gradient of a function uh, knows about the Ricci curvature of your manifold in this sense. You take the Laplacian of your vector field, or in particular the norm squared of its. Uh, of the vector field, uh, and that will contain the Ricci curvature of your manifold. 
you know, you're, yeah, this is a general fact about one forms of vector fields on a manifold. Uh, that bundle contains the curvature, uh, the, the Ricci curvature part of your, your curvature of your underlying manifold. What does this have to do with uh, the scalar curvature? A priori, nothing. However, uh, if you think of a level set of, so you have your manifold M here, and you have a, a level set of your function, I call it sigma, you can think of the gradient as, uh, I mean, the gradient will be orthogonal to this level set, the gradient of U. In particular, you know, the gradient of U over the norm of that will be a normal vector field to a level set. You know, just the gradient of a function is orthogonal to its level sets. Okay, <clears throat> now if you recall, there's a way, Kaskodazi, I uh, formulas of relating the curvature of the ambient manifold uh, to uh, the curvature of a submanifold. <clears throat> you can break up, in particular, you can break up the scalar curvature of the ambient three manifold in terms of the scalar curvature of the level set or you know, submanifold sigma. And what is left over? You know, the scalar curvature of the ambient manifold, that's a larger thing, it contains the sum of many things. Uh, you also get two Ricci in the normal direction. This is the unit normal direction. Uh, and then uh, some terms involving uh, extrinsic curvature of your sigma. Okay, so the point is, roughly speaking, uh, the Ricci curvature can be rewritten as the difference of scalar curvatures of your ambient manifold and your level set. So that is a way in which you can replace this Ricci curvature term appearing in the Bachner formula for a vector field with something having to do with scalar curvature. Now, uh, you know, there's still other stuff left over you have to sort out, uh, but this is the rough idea. And then this uh, scalar curvature of a level set is related to the topology of the level set in, the, in this dimension, because this is a three-dimensional ambient manifold. This level set of a function to real numbers uh, has dimension two, and you can apply gauss bonnet and extract the Euler characteristic from uh, the integral of uh, scalar curvature of the level set. That is the fundamental, uh, in my opinion, the fundamental idea that uh, Daniel Stern um, had to create some very beautiful formulas involving scalar curvature uh, and harmonic maps to S1, or as we'll apply them to R, uh, to relate the topology of the manifold and the level sets to uh, scalar curvature of the ambient manifold. OK, so when you carry this out, <clears throat> uh, you will get some, some things. So the, if you apply this on a bounded region omega inside of your asymptotically flat manifold, <clears throat> so here is, say, well, maybe I shouldn't have put this bottom piece. So here is your region omega. Uh, if you apply this idea that I just mentioned, uh, you and, and you integrate the Laplace of the, the length of the gradient of your harmonic function. You know, we're on where k is equal to zero. So harmonic function uh, is the same as space-time harmonic function, k is vanishing. Um, and then you get an uh, equation saying that this is equal to, or rather greater than or equal to, the integral of the Hessian of u squared over the Hessian norm u plus scalar curvature of m times the gradient of u. <clears throat> and uh, as you can tell, we've used the gauss uh, already. <clears throat> yeah, we, we apply it to uh, manifolds with boundary because notice that the level sets in the bounded region of a function that's asymptotically linear uh, will look something like this. This will be like the level sets of our asymptotically linear function, sigma t, call it. <clears throat> and so we are applying the Gauss-Bonnet theorem to a surface with boundary. So there's a curvature of the uh, boundary of those surfaces appearing here. 
And we're integrating over the minimum and maximum values of the harmonic function, uh, those values it takes on this, on this region, omega. We'll eventually take uh, omega uh, going out to infinity. OK. So this is the, uh, you would call this maybe a boundary term. You get one boundary term from integrating this by parts, just the normal derivative of the normal the gradient of uh, uh, u. And then you have uh, these so-called boundary terms that come from applying Gauss-Bonnet to a surface with boundary inside of your four manifold. And we're integrating overall values of t. These sigma t's foliate the entire region. OK, and the fact is, and this requires some calculation, I, that I won't do in front of you right now. Uh, but the fact is, is that these converge to mass. If you choose the uh, omegas exhausting the end of your manifold, uh, then these two terms will both contribute something to uh, mass. And their sum will be 8 pi mass, or 6. Uh, yeah, 16 pi mass. OK, and uh, so here is just the statement. Uh, if you do this argument, you take omega exhausting these regions, you know, applying these calculational uh, observations and, and tools developed by Daniel Stern, uh, you get the following theorem, which is a precursor to the one that I just mentioned, uh, which is joint work with um, Hugh Bray, myself, Marcus Curie, and Daniel Stern. <coughs> uh, so uh, if you take L as above, a linear function uh, at infinity, uh, you can find a canonical harmonic function uh, defined on an exterior region uh, associated to the end in question. Uh, you have your asymptotically flat manifold. Uh, and let me describe what I mean by uh, exterior region. Uh, so as you can tell, the, the topology of the level sets will, will be important. And if you don't uh, rule out certain topology of the ambient manifold, then this can be a problem. Uh, notice uh, if these level sets contain many um, spherical components, then this order characteristic can get large, uh, which would cause a problem. Uh, because this boundary term here, you would expect to converge to something close to 2 pi. Uh, because these uh, level sets, this function is asymptotic to a linear function, and uh, the level sets of these functions will be very uh, close to planes. And so uh, if you take these omegas large, this, this uh, total geodesic curvature will be like the total geodesic curvature of a disk in a plane, which is about 2 pi. I mean, it is 2 pi. Good. <clears throat> so in order to deal with uh, that, to deal with the issue of uh, spherical components to level sets, which is the enemy for getting uh, for estimating this term, uh, we need to not consider a harmonic function on the underlying manifold, but to uh, consider an exterior region, uh, which is what I'm highlighting right now. This green part would be m x. Uh, this is a portion of the manifold that you can, well, you define it the following way. You delete all closed minimal surfaces from your asymptotically flat manifold. You know, in the picture here, uh, you know, it looks like there's a minimal surface here, a minimal surface here, and there's minimal surfaces here and here. Maybe there's many of them, uh, you know, who knows? Uh, you know, maybe there's a minimal one there, minimal one there. You remove all of these minimal surfaces. Um, and you remove all regions bounded by minimal surfaces. You delete all of those, all the bounded components in the complement of the collection of minimal surfaces. And uh, then you take the, the resulting thing as an open manifold because you've deleted these minimal surfaces that are co-dimension one submanifolds as a results in an open thing. Uh, then you take the metric completion of the resulting thing, and this is the exterior region. <clears throat> OK, the end is isometric to uh, the end of the original manifold. You've just removed some, some parts of, the, of your manifold. And it has the property that there's no longer any homology. 
And so this resolves this issue of uh, uh, spherical level sets that I mentioned. OK, so you need to pass to this region, solve the harmonic equation there, and do this argument uh, that you described here, uh, that we just described. OK, um, so from here, it's a little bit more uh, clear that you know if the scalar curvature is not negative, then you immediately get uh, at the mass of your time symmetric initial data set is non-negative. And if scalar curvature is non-negative and uh, m is equal to 0, then what do you get? You get a harmonic function. Uh, so you get uh, asymptotically linear u with vanishing Hessian. So in other words, the gradient of u is a parallel vector field. Not only that, but you can choose L to be pointing in the x direction. You can choose L to be the linear function, you know, the y coordinate, or you can choose the z coordinate. You get uh, an entire frame of parallel vector fields. OK, you might be concerned about the fact that you are dividing by the length of the gradient here. OK, if you want to conclude that the Hessian is actually vanishing in the case that m is 0, uh, you better be sure that uh, the L2 norm of the Hessian is actually vanishing, which is you need, you need to worry about this, uh, the length of the gradient. Uh, but if you, you can leverage the fact that you know that the, the gradient is close to 1 at infinity, it's converging to 1 at infinity, and then you can integrate along a geodesic use the fact that you already know the Hessian is small along this uh, geodesic to then conclude that uh, the, the, the gradient cannot vanish. The gradient of these harmonic functions can't vanish in the case of uh, m is equal to 0. And so um, you get a frame of parallel vector fields, which means your manifold is flat. And so you have to be, I mean, you're, you know you're simply connected already at this point. Um, and so you'll have to be uh, Euclidean space. So the case of equality is uh, straightforward here as well. In the space-time setting, it's uh, you have to build a space-time uh, into which your initial data set embeds uh, and show that that space-time is flat. Uh, and let me just mention that. If you go back to the main theorem, the space-time setting, so if, say, E and P vanish, then you use uh, the gradient uh, of U I for I equal, you know, pointing in the X direction, Y direction, Z direction to uh, construct a Lorentzian 4 manifold uh, into which MGK embeds. And then uh, you show the following for this construction that uh, space time Hessian vanishing uh, implies that uh, H is flat. And so it must be Minkowski space. OK, very good. Uh, to, to conclude, I'd like to just uh, remark on the similarities to the spinner proof. So just like uh, in Witten's proof of the positive mass theorem, <clears throat> you can, you know, we consider kind of, uh, we have a function on the underlying manifold, but we really consider uh, a, a one form on the ambient manifold N in the sense that we uh, build a section of that bundle and use the connection on that bundle. So in the same way as uh, Witten takes the spinner bundle borrowed from the ambient bundle and uses the connection to find there and considers uh, solutions to a you know harmonic equation, Dirac harmonic, which are constant to um, a constant spinner at a, uh, you know, asymptotic to a constant spinner at infinity. Uh, and the comparison uh, is to compare the spinner to the differential. Uh, a view for uh, space-time harmonic. 
u. Okay, so the, the objects we're comparing, comparing are the spinner and the, the differential. What is the relation to uh, between these two things? Well, here's one observation. It's really incomplete. The, the answer is we don't really know what uh, a direct uh, analog or dictionary between one and the other. But here's something that we do know. Given a spinner, phi, uh, you can square this to a one form, or alternatively, a vector field. I'll, I'll consider it a one form, uh, alpha, in the following way. You want to define. You know, to define a one form, you need to say how it acts on a vector field x. And here's the formula. Alpha on x is equal to the Hermitian inner product, um, x acting on phi with phi. Uh, this is a totally, by the way, a totally uh, imaginary uh, one form. Uh, notice because, uh, you know, this is equal to minus x, uh, well, you can act by x. And this is equal to minus phi, x phi, using the Hermitian property. This is minus the conjugate x phi, phi. Uh, and so uh, alpha of x, plus alpha of x bar is equal to 0. Uh, right. So in other words, this is totally real. OK, so sorry, this is totally real. Good. No, 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 it's totally imaginary. Sorry, my mistake. Because this is 2 times the real part of alpha of x. OK, good. <laughs> uh, all right. Now, here is uh, the observation. If you compute uh, the Dirac operator on phi, inner product with phi, consider the imaginary part, uh, that is 0 if and only if alpha is clo closed, or in other words, d of star alpha is equal to 0. OK, so uh, in particular, the Dirac operator on phi equals 0 will imply that uh, this one form is co-closed. And in particular, um, or you know, if in addition, uh, alpha is closed and is the differential of a, uh, I mean, if it's exact, if it's the differential of a function u, then uh, u will be space-time harmonic, will satisfy space-time harmonic condition. All right, because the co-differential, uh, yeah, I mean, the alpha being co-closed is the same as the underlying function being space-time harmonic. OK, so you get the following picture that uh, relates these two, um, these two proofs. Um, so you know, loosely speaking, you know, modulo these, these uh, assumptions, uh, if you have a harmonic spinner, uh, you can then square it to a one form which then you have the chance of integrating to a function, space-time harmonic function u. And by studying the level sets of that space-time harmonic function, you can uh, relate the total mass of the initial data set to uh, the dominant energy condition. OK, so uh, that, that is all I wanted to. Uh, tell you about this, uh, this recent work. There's also some uh, recent applications to uh, hyperbolic uh, initial data sets. And uh, studying their mass. Uh, and I hope you, you take a look at some of these works. Uh, there is lots of room for. Um, young researchers to uh, uh, prove something interesting about uh, using these ideas. And they are somewhat elementary. Uh, so I, I, hope you, uh, I hope you please take a look. And feel free to uh, email me at uh, Dimitri Kazaris at duke.edu uh, if you have uh, any further questions or comments. OK.
Thank you for your attention.